Welcome to Eric Hurst's Training for Climbing podcast. Training for Climbing podcast. Training for Climbing. Training for Climbing. Training for Climbing. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Training for Climbing podcast. I'm Eric Hurst, and today I'm going to deliver the first of a two part in depth look at energy system training. The bioenergetics that inside your muscle cells generate ATP that power your climbing movements. It's a really fascinating topic with concepts that can be hugely empowering if you really can grasp onto the information, understand it, and apply it to your workouts and all you do in the name of climbing. There's implications when it comes to diet and nutrition and rest and recovery. Uh, and just how you go about attacking a route. Knowledge of the three energy systems that work together to power your climbing will make you more effective in all you do in the gym and on the rock. Before we get started, I first want to take a moment and reiterate for new listeners what the goal is of the Training for Climbing podcast. You might consider it kind of my mission statement. If you've been listening for a few months, or maybe you've heard all of the podcasts over the last couple of years, you know what my MO is. You know what my approach to things is. Uh, But if you're new to the podcast, let me just give you a quick recap. It'll take a few minutes, and then we'll dig into the very interesting topic of energy system training. Okay, so uh, first of all, new listeners, you should go back and listen to all of the previous podcasts. Because what I'm building here, month over month, is really an encyclopedia of training for climbing and climbing science and how to become a better climber and how to become a successful climber for life. And so this encyclopedia, it has a new chapter added to it each and every month with the new training for climbing podcast. And, uh, you know, I've been at this a long time. This is my 40th year as a climber. I started as a youngster, age 13, back in Uh, the late 1970s, and so I've been in the sport as it's evolved from a very small niche sport of traditional climbers into uh, a sport that's going to be in the Olympics in a couple of years. And so with the rapid growth of the sport, with the growth of competition climbing, with uh, sport climbing, uh, you know, the pushing of new barriers, the opening up of new grades, and uh, really the evidence that regular folks, weekend warriors, can climb at a very high level there's become a growing thirst for information on training for climbing. And so that's one of the things I try to do is to to meet that thirst and give high quality information, evidence-based, at least as evidence-based as can be, uh, information that gives you safe and practical and pragmatic guidelines that will help you train more effectively and hopefully avoid injury and grow as a complete climber. That's something I'm really big on. Hopefully you will be able to become a climber for life. You know, this is a great life sport that you can be involved with into your middle age. And I plan to be into it into my old age because I'm in my early 50s now and uh, I don't have any intention of quitting climbing anytime soon. Uh, In any case, uh, you know, I'm no Johnny-come-lately when it comes to this topic. I've been writing about the subject as long as anybody on the planet. Uh, I wrote my first magazine articles on training for climbing back in uh, 1987, I believe, for Rock and Ice magazine. Back then, they weren't even interested in training articles. I had to kind of sell them on the idea that, hey, people might want to know how to train for climbing. It wasn't something that was discussed much outside of a handful of elite climbers in Europe and in America. Uh, In any case, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this subject, studying exercise physiology, motor learning and performance, sports psychology, and experimenting and creating, and delving into the relevant research, both climbing and non-climbing research. And so trying to put that puzzle together, and it's like 3D chess. I mean, it's a complex puzzle, uh, is something that is ongoing. And as advanced as Training for Climbing is in some ways right now, and uh, you know, my latest edition of Training for Climbing really documents the current state of the art in comprehensive Training for Climbing, 
But I'll tell you what, I think in another three or four or five years, I'm going to have to write the fourth edition of Training for Climbing because there's a lot of stuff in the works that is exciting, that's going to take training to the next level. And uh, I'm excited to, to be a small part of it and help bring uh, the material to you. And so in any case, uh, you know, I'm passionate about this topic. Even if I'm not training, I'm thinking about training. And, uh, and I'm someone who, for the most part, trains year-round. Uh, not over-the-top training, but hopefully I'm finding that sweet spot, just the right amount for me at my age and where I'm at in the sport to remain the best that I can be on the rock and to stay healthy and uh, injury-free so that I can climb at a high level for many years to come. So in any case, you know, the goal of this podcast is it's to not target any individual area or type of climber. Certain episodes will cater more to perhaps advanced and elite climbers, like this current episode. And other episodes may cater more to the beginner or intermediate climber and help them uh, learn how to be a better climber through developing climbing skill and climbing strategy and the vital mental skills that are necessary to become an effective rock climber. Uh, If you're in this to become the best that you can be, you need to have a comprehensive approach. You just can't focus on developing stronger fingers, nor can you focus just on developing climbing skill. Sure, climbing skill is important, but climbing requires a strong mind and a strong body. So, you know, you need to work on all aspects of the game to improve long term. I mentioned a moment ago that I do read a lot of research. And, you know, I'm not here to just rehash and recycle old ways of training, things that we've been talking about for the last 20 years, yeah, there's a lot of effective practices that uh, have been developed and that I've written about and that other coaches and podcasters talk and write about. It's important to learn that stuff, but to advance this sport, we need to advance what we do in the gym. We need to make training for climbing more effective. And so uh, by way of research, the work of a number of researchers, both in and outside of climbing, and through my own work and my own experimentation, I'm putting together new protocols that I hope in the coming years will become mainstream and in use by the mass of climbers. So there you have it. That kind of gets all the new listeners up to speed on what this Training for Climbing podcast is all about. Uh, To all listeners of this podcast, I invite you to write a review at some point if you feel moved. If you really love what I'm doing here, the feedback is much appreciated. You can leave a review on iTunes. Uh, You can email me feedback through my website, trainingforclimbing.com. And please do share this podcast with your friends. Uh, Email a link to the podcast. uh, Tell them to search iTunes for the Eric Hurst Training for Climbing podcast. And uh, I'd like to keep this community growing and share my information to the widest audience possible. And a final comment, um, next month, uh, that would be early April, I'm planning to do a little side podcast something called Ask Coach Hurst. And that's your chance to submit questions to me, which I will select the best questions, the ones that I think uh, will be interesting to the most listeners. And I will share the answers with you via a special edition of the Training for Climbing podcast. So if you'd like to submit a short question to me, here's how to do it. Um, Go to my Twitter account. It's at train for climbing Just spell out train, T-R-A-I-N, the number four, climbing. And I'm going to pin to the top a post uh, about the Ask Coach Hurst podcast, and you can reply or comment to that post with your question or leave two comments if your question needs more than, you know, one set of characters that Twitter allows. And uh, keep it very specific, very targeted. Uh, If you can begin with your name, where you're from, how many years you've been climbing, and then give me your question uh, in a sentence or two or three, and uh, I'll collect them over the next couple of weeks and record a podcast and have it online uh, in mid-April for you 
to uh, hear all the answers. And hopefully everybody will find it a fun and interesting way to uh, learn a little more about training for climbing as I give you my perspective and thoughts on each of the, the questions submitted. So, okay, well, I guess this is a good time to move on and get to the meat of this podcast, which is energy system training. This is a topic that I've been studying for, I guess, the last five or six years. Certainly, it's a subject that sports scientists have talked about for many years, uh, in, in particular, looking at different sports and seeing how uh, one sport has a different requirement when it comes to uh, ATP production and which energy system tends to dominate compared to another sport. Even some of the early climbing researchers like uh, Dr. Watts here in the United States and uh, Bertuzzi, I bl believe, down in Brazil, did studies back you know, 10 or 15 years ago where they uh, looked at climbers and what the energy requirements were and tried to kind of unlock the puzzle with regard to climbing. But applying it to training for climbing, that's something new. And uh, there's a, a couple of folks, a couple of coaches and climbers, both in the U.S. and Europe, who have been working on this the last few years. Uh, in my uh, third edition of Training for Climbing, which came out about a year and a half ago, I wrote a pretty in-depth section on uh, energy system training for climbing and how you can assess your strengths and weaknesses with regard to the different energy systems and how you can train the individual energy systems. Hey, that what's in the book is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, there's more to be built out by climbing researchers and climbing coaches, and that work is underway right now. And so in this podcast and the next podcast, I'm going to give you a pretty detailed lecture, I guess you might call it, on uh, energy systems and how to train the individual energy systems. And, and I must say, I kind of need to put my professor hat on. And if I could stand in front of a, a blackboard or uh, in front of a screen and give you a PowerPoint, it would be a lot easier to uh, discuss this topic because it, it can get really complex and you can really get down into the weeds of biochemistry if you really wanted to. And, and although I may get into that just a bit here today, I'm going to try to, to not get overly scientific uh, and unnecessarily divert down any rabbit holes. But I'll tell you, it's a topic that you could, and I could, <laughs> go off on some big tangents because there are implications when it comes to diet and nutrition and recovery and even things like, should you supplement with creatine? Should you eat a low-carbohydrate diet? Um how long should you rest between a boulder problem or between route attempts? I mean, there are a lot of things that tie into the bioenergetics, uh, what's going on inside your muscle cells. And so uh, you could go off on a lot of tangents because this is a topic that really provides a foundation for so much of what is going on when you're at the crags and in the gym. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is first of all give you uh, just a general overview of the three energy systems, and then I'm going to drill down into the anaerobic alactic energy system and really break down what is going on there and how you can best target and train that energy system. Then in the next podcast, we'll look at the other two energy systems, anaerobic lactic and the aerobic energy system, and we'll do the same thing. We'll drill down into those, and I'll try to explain to you uh, what is going on and what are the take-home points when it comes to training most effectively those energy systems. Okay, so what are energy systems? Well, they are the metabolic pathways that produce ATP for muscular contractions. There are three major energy pathways. All three contribute to ATP production at any given moment, but depending on the power requirements of an exercise or on a climb, well, only one or two of these energy pathways may dominate, but they're all at work all the time. Uh, and so it is a complex topic to unweave, but let's try. First up is the anaerobic alactic energy system, uh, often also referred to as the ATP-CP energy system. And this energy system enables brief, intense movements, like doing a few powerful pull-ups or a lunge move or a maximal 
contraction of your finger flexors to hang on a really small edge or pocket. If you are working at near 100% intensity for a brief moment, a few seconds, maybe up to 8 or 10 seconds, well then, this is the energy system that is providing the bulk of the ATP that is split to release energy to fuel muscular contraction. No doubt rock climbing demands a strong anaerobic alactic energy system because it is what powers you through those brutal crux moves or up a short hard boulder problem or through a brief crux sequence or just grabbing onto that one small hold for the instant it takes to advance to the next hold. The problem is intracellular stores of ATP and CP are very limited, only enough to supply 5 to maybe 10 seconds of intense muscular contraction and high power output. The good news is depleted creatine phosphate stores can recover quickly during rest periods or even submaximal climbing as long as there is oxygenated blood flowing through capillaries of the working muscle, your body can regenerate creatine phosphate and recover enough of the anaerobic alactic system for the next hard move or the next hard exercise. So already we're seeing a way how a different energy system, the aerobic energy system, plays a role and dovetails with the anaerobic alactic energy system in that when oxygen is flowing through the muscles, the aerobic energy system is what drives recovery and the resynthesis of creatine phosphate and enables you to kind of recharge your ATP, CP energy system for the next hard move. And this is an important distinction. A strong aerobic energy system is therefore important for climbing if recovery is important and if there's a need to do many hard moves or bursts of hard moves in a row, as in putting a red point ascent together. Recent research has confirmed this concept in showing that aerobically trained climbers, those who engage in regular non-specific aerobic activities such as running, they recover faster than climbers who did no generalized cardiovascular training. Furthermore, Simon Fryer, a researcher out of the UK, has shown that the finger flexor muscles of elite climbers use and replenish oxygen at a much higher rate than non-elites. So what is going on in the forearms? It's more than just how strong can you make the finger flexor muscles. The aerobic energy system, as we're going to really dig into next time, uh, plays a crucial role in not only uh, powering climbing movements, but recovery uh, of the high energy phosphates that get you through those very hardest moves and enable you to hang on those very smallest holds. The second energy system, the second pathway by which ATP is produced in the muscles, is the anaerobic lactic energy system. Uh, it sounds a lot like the previous one, alactic. Uh, the only difference is the letter A. But in this case, it's uh, anaerobic energy production that produces lactate as a byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis. And so some people call this the glycolytic pathway. This process of glycolysis can rapidly regenerate ATP in an oxygen-free, that's anaerobic, environment, which is a common state of the forearm flexor muscles during high-intensity isometric contractions. Muscle contractions of as little as 15% of maximum voluntary contraction, or 15% of your peak finger force, begin to impede blood flow through your muscles, and contractions of 50% of your maximum voluntary contraction completely occlude blood flow, which means at this point, there's no fresh blood, no new oxygen perfused into the finger flexor muscles, in which case ATP can only be generated via the anaerobic energy pathway. And so it's easy to understand why the anaerobic lactic energy system is so often called upon in climbing. Common hallmarks of a hard-working anaerobic lactic energy system are the muscular pain and the pump and the growing shortness of breath and increasing fatigue and 
drop in power output that occurs between, say, about 30 seconds and two minutes of hard, sustained climbing. So think about those long crux sequences or even a long boulder problem on which you feel totally fresh the first 10 or 20 seconds, and then all of a sudden the pain and the pump begins to develop, and your power output is dropping off rapidly, especially after about one minute of sustained effort. That is the anaerobic lactic system beginning to fail you and really by about 75 seconds into hard sustained climbing or exercise, the aerobic energy system takes over as the primary source of ATP production as the anaerobic lactic system begins to run aground for a number of reasons that you'll learn about in the next podcast. The third energy system is the aerobic system. And as I mentioned a moment ago, after about 75 seconds of sustained hard exercise or climbing, the aerobic energy system comes into play and quickly becomes the primary source of ATP production at the expense of a much lower power output. And so um, the good news is aerobic energy production can continue for a long time almost indefinitely, or you know, for an hour or two. Uh, the bad news is the power output is at best about one-third of your maximum power output. And so, yeah, you can climb a long time, but it's not going to be at your maximum level. It's going to be uh, several notches below your maximum level. Basically, whatever the grade is that you can climb at with just one-third of your maximum strength or one-third of your maximum power output that is the level that you will be able to sustain with the aerobic energy system acting as your primary source of ATP production. Now let me tell you about a study that I think you'll find interesting. It was done uh, by Bertuzzi. I mentioned him earlier. And uh, he brought some climbers into the lab and tested them and determined that in rigorous climbing, ATP production was 36% via the alactic energy system, 22% the anaerobic lactic energy system, and 42% via the aerobic energy system. And so the aerobic energy system was the most dominant of the three. The anaerobic alactic was second most dominant, and the lactic system was third at just 22% of the ATP production. Now that might seem curious to you because many people when they fail on a climb, it's with really pumped forearms, which are evidence of the anaerobic lactic energy system has failed them or that it was just powered out and that they could not proceed any longer at the lower power output provided by the aerobic energy system. Uh, And so that um, thought process leads many climbers down the path of really focusing on power endurance training as like their holy grail. That is what's going to get them to the next level. But what we are beginning to understand is that energy system, it's the least trainable. You are never going to train that up to a level that it's going to be able to carry you up every climb. It is at best going to produce around 20 or 22% of your total ATP production. And so to generate the high power outputs needed for climbing, you need a stronger aerobic energy system, and you also need to make your muscles more efficient when they're in that high anaerobic alactic power mode. And so that's what we're going to dig down into today is look at that anaerobic alactic energy system and how you can train that up to a higher level. Okay, so I promised earlier that I wouldn't geek out and get into too much science, uh, but I need to dabble. I need to give you a little bit of information here. Uh, We're going to kind of proceed and look at this from three different angles. Uh, First, we're going to examine what's going on inside the muscle cell in terms of the ATP production and uh, the energy uh, that is uh, liberated and uh, fueling your powerful muscle movements and maximal finger force contractions. Then we're going to take a look at what the adaptations are that we're seeking 
when we do training, when we do intense training that works this anaerobic alactic energy system. And then third, we'll look at specific exercises, what types of things you can do that train the muscles and will help elevate the anaerobic alactic energy system and ultimately give you higher anaerobic power. And that's really the goal of the anaerobic alactic energy system is to generate as high a power output as possible for a brief time. And I'm talking three to five seconds, at most 10 seconds, but really anaerobic power is all about what is the peak power output you can generate in about five seconds. Uh, and so that is pretty much what you're testing. When, when I test a climber's peak finger force, how much finger force they can generate in five seconds, I am testing their anaerobic alactic energy system. Uh, if you put somebody on a campus board and have them do the hardest move they can do, whether it's one, three, five, or one, four, seven, or one, five, eight, you name it, that is essentially a test of the anaerobic alactic energy system. Now, there's many facets, many things that contribute to the skill and uh, expressing the power on the campus board or into the finger force tester, but those are the types of activities that elicit peak anaerobic power output. And, uh, and so that's where we're going right now. Okay, so first we're going to go inside the muscle cell and talk about what's going on in terms of the production of ATP. Uh, ATP, again, that's the source of energy. ATP is split and in the process releases energy that fuels muscle contraction. And so doing intense muscular contractions and powerful movements involves splitting a high volume of ATP very, very rapidly. And inside of your muscle cells, there is a small storage of ATP and CP, which is creatine phosphate, enough to fuel a few seconds of intense exercise. The instant you begin contracting your muscles, uh, intracellular stores of ATP are split, but your brain will only allow you to do that for about a second or two. And then it doesn't want to use up all of its ATP supply. So that's when the creatine phosphate comes in to play to contribute a phosphate to uh, regenerate ATP and continue forceful muscular contraction for up to about 10 seconds. So if you imagine me writing out this metabolic process on a blackboard, it would be an ATP gets split and releases energy and that split ATP results in an ADP and an inorganic phosphate. To recycle and have new ATP, well, the creatine phosphate comes in. That hydrolysis of creatine phosphate donates a phosphate back along with the ADP to create an ATP. And then that process can repeat itself. As long as there are creatine phosphate stores inside the muscle cell, immediate to where the, you know, contraction is occurring. This process is called Lerman's reaction. It was first identified by a German scientist, of course. His name was Hans Carl Adolf Heinrich Lohmann. That's a mouthful, but that is seriously his name. And this is more than 100 years ago, so this is not new science, but this Lerman reaction is what is going on inside the muscle cell during the first 10 seconds or so of forceful muscular contraction. It's interesting to note that, and I guess it's your brain, doesn't allow your body to use up all of the stored ATP inside of your cells. In fact, studies of bioenergetics where they've actually looked inside of muscle cells, there's a couple different ways to do it with needle biopsies, and now they do it via magnetic resonance spectroscopy. That's easy for you to say. Um, in any case, they can now peer inside of the muscle cells and see what's going on. And it's interesting to note that uh, during these forceful muscle contractions, when the anaerobic alactic energy system is at work hard, the amount of ATP inside of the muscle cell doesn't really go down much. It goes down by maybe 10%. 
And then the creatine phosphate comes into play and starts contributing that phosphate to keep regenerating ATP and never allowing the cellular ATP to drop below about 90% of its uh, full value or what you might call the baseline value that you have right now. And the reason for that, I guess, is that you know ATP is needed constantly, not just during exercise, but right now, wherever you're at, you are splitting ATP to not only contract muscles, but to relax muscles. And so ATP is utilized constantly throughout your body, even while you're sleeping. Your brain, your organs, everything is constantly splitting ATP. And that ATP, of course, in kind of a low energy steady state is being generated aerobically via oxidative phosphorylation uh, inside of mitochondria. But in any case, those ATP supplies in your muscle cells are maintained at a, at a certain level. And the only time they go to zero is when you're dead. Uh, and, and that's, by the way, why rigor mortis uh, occurs. Uh, within a few hours of dying, your muscles get stiff. And that is because there's no ATP left. I mentioned a moment ago, ATP is needed not only to contract muscles, but to relax muscles. And so when the ATP is used up inside of your muscle cells, uh, the muscles contract and get stiff and rigor sets in. So uh, when you die, actually anaerobic glycolysis takes over for a period of time, a few hours in large muscles, and can still supply ATP after you're dead, but there's no more oxidative phosphorylation occurring because there's no blood flow, there's no oxygen anymore. Uh, and so eventually when you use up your glycogen and your glucose, then there's no more ATP, and so rigor mortis sets in. But enough with this morbid stuff. Um, moving on here. Uh, creatine phosphate supplies do get used up, not completely, but in very intense exercise, if you go really hard to failure, uh, you can utilize up to 90% of your creatine phosphate intracellular stores. Uh, and that creatine phosphate, it's right immediate to where energy production is occurring. That's why it is so instant. You know, this energy system is instant on, like flicking a switch. The ATP and CP, they're in the muscle cells. It happens instantaneously. And that's why it's a quick source of uh, maximal power output. But the creatine phosphate does get used up in a matter of seconds, and quickly anaerobic glycolysis kicks in. That's the next energy system, the anaerobic lactic energy system that we'll be uh, talking about extensively in the next podcast. But really, uh, when you're doing intense exercise, about five seconds into it, signals begin uh, to trigger that anaerobic glycolytic system to start firing up. And by 10 seconds, anaerobic glycolysis is already beginning to contribute to ATP production. Not a lot, but it is beginning. And then it quickly ramps up after 10 seconds of sustained intense exercise because the ATP and CP system has played out and has become uh, diminished and fatigued. Okay, so before I move on, I'm going to go off on two little tangents here. And one of them relates to uh, consuming supplemental creatine. And that's a really big thing in sports these days. It's one of the biggest selling supplements in sports. And for some sports, it's a really effective, helpful supplement. And in other sports, it's not so useful for various reasons. And in the case of rock climbing, I don't think, uh, in my opinion, and I've studied this ex extensively, I, I don't believe that creatine is a supplement that you want to use uh, in a big time way. And I'm going to tell you why. The reason people take creatine is by consuming it in large doses, you can increase the intracellular storage in the cytosol of creatine phosphate. And therefore, that will extend uh, the life of that ATP energy system a little longer. Uh, it maybe will extend you a few more seconds. And, and during a brief period of rest, you will perhaps recover a little more quickly. But it's not necessary because if you have a strong aerobic energy system during periods of rest, 
mitochondria can crank out ATP and resynthesize creatine phosphate really, really fast. Uh, in a climber or in an athlete with a high aerobic power, in a matter of about 20 seconds, they can resynthesize as much as 50% of their creatine phosphate locally inside of the muscle without the need of taking a supplement to try to get you an extra couple of seconds of creatine phosphate. And you might say, well, Eric, you know, what would be the harm in doing it? Well, I'll tell you what the harm is. If you do creatine loading, which is what a lot of athletes do, where you consume 10 or 15 or 20 grams a day, if you do that to really pump up the storage of creatine phosphate, well, it also draws water into the cell. And so two things happen. When you bring water into the muscle cell, the muscle cell grows in size. It increases the volume. And that volumization actually squeezes the capillaries that surround the muscle cells. Those capillaries are critical for rock climbing because red blood cells flow through the capillaries and diffuse oxygen into the muscle cell and, of course, grab onto CO2 to remove from the muscle cell. And so if you are occluding or if you're squeezing those capillaries because your muscle cells have been volumized with this extra water, uh, then you uh, inhibit blood flow. And so what uh, climbers will notice if they take a lot of creatine, if they load creatine, they will get really pumped up. Like if they'll get on a climb and climb for a minute hard, and yes, the first 10 or 15 seconds, they will feel like this little extra zip in their fingers and forearms and their pulling muscles because there's a little extra creatine there. But then as that starts, that when that anaerobic alactic energy system starts to run out after, say, 10 seconds, and the need for blood supply becomes critical, well, they get pumped. And therefore, the blood supply is uh, hindered, and there's really an adverse effect on your ability to not only generate ATP aerobically, but to recover. And so you get these sick pumps that result. And so I think it's a better approach to forget the creatine phosphate and just develop more aerobic power, the ability for your cell's mitochondria to resynthesize creatine phosphate more quickly. And so you could look at a creatine supplement as kind of a quick fix. But if you're in this for the long haul, why not develop your bioenergetic systems to do the job for you the way kind of God made your muscle cells to work? And, you know, I tend to think that your DNA knows what's best for you and that your genes will express in ways to top off creatine phosphate stores at an optimum level. And for whatever activities you are subjecting the muscles to, yeah, training, uh, high intensity training will increase a little bit the intracellular stores of creatine phosphate. But when you do alactic training, you really aren't increasing all that much those intracellular stores. In fact, ATP stores don't go up at all as a result of training and creatine phosphate stores might go up a small amount. The training adaptations are actually unrelated to the fuel itself, and we're, we're going to get into those adaptations in just a moment. But first, one more thing about creatine supplementation. Because you're drawing water into the cells with the extra creatine phosphate that is being stored, you gain weight. And so if you go through the creatine loading protocol that athletes commonly do, you will put on a few pounds of extra weight. It's water weight. Now, bodybuilders like it because it makes their muscles bigger, and they think, hey, bigger muscles, you know, I'm stronger. But really, um, their muscles aren't that much stronger. They just have a little bit extra fuel in the tank, you might say. And they have all this extra water in there that's made their muscles swell. And again, bodybuilders like that. And so that's a useful thing if you're into bodybuilding. Uh, if you're into rock climbing, putting on a couple extra pounds of water weight is stupid, okay? Because in hard bouldering, in high-end sport climbing, 
These are strength to weight ratio sports, power to weight ratio activities. And so putting on weight that really doesn't help you in a significant way is a dumb thing to do. And so if you're a bodybuilder, go for the creatine phosphate and load it up. And you know, if you're even a um, sprinter where you do a 10 second sprint and then you stand around for 15 minutes and don't do anything, creatine phosphate may be beneficial. You're not going to be exercising long enough to pump out. And even if you're a football player, creatine can be a useful supplement because what is American football? It's sprint for five or 10 seconds and then rest for 45 seconds or a minute. And so the extra zip in the first few seconds of exercise could be helpful. And also the added mass, you know, that cell volumization I talked about? Well, in a football player, if you add lean mass, if you're a running back or a tackler, that extra mass can be beneficial when you're playing a collision-oriented sport. Uh, but in rock climbing, where it's you against gravity, that extra mass is a bad thing. Okay, next in our drill down into anaerobic alactic training or exercises that really work that energy system, uh, let's talk about the adaptations that we seek. What are we after? Well, I mentioned a few moments ago that one adaptation that doesn't occur is increased storage of intercellular ATP. That's kind of set. That's a fixed amount. It doesn't change as a result of training. The creatine phosphate stores will go up slightly as a result of training. They can go up a lot. If you take supplemental creatine, as I mentioned earlier, though I don't recommend it, unless you're a vegetarian, then taking a couple grams a day might be a good thing, but I'll leave it at that. Um, in any case, what you're really after here is uh, increasing muscle efficiency. Uh, making the muscles stronger, yes, but also getting more force production out of the fixed amount of ATP and creatine phosphate that you have stored inside of the muscle cells. And there is a lot to be gained here, big time. You know, the first thing that comes to people's minds is hypertrophy, building bigger muscles. But there's more to getting stronger and more powerful than bigger muscles. And in the context of wanting to increase climbing performance, I would argue that bigger muscles are the wrong solution or they are the wrong goal of your training. And so um, let's, let's dig a little deeper here and talk about three types of adaptations that result from these uh, high power, brief, forceful training activities that utilize the anaerobic alactic energy system predominantly. The three types of adaptations that can take place and will take place if you do some really targeted, dedicated training here. Number one is neural adaptations. Number two are architectural changes, uh, not only muscle cell hypertrophy, but also changes in the extracellular matrix. And then number three uh, involves the tendons, uh, making the tendons stiffer and specifically increasing the gradient of stiffness from one end of the tendon to the other. This will improve the efficiency and uh, transmit forces more quickly with less energy loss. And so combined, these three adaptations provide the potential for long-term increases in your maximum strength and power output. Uh, and you know, when you start a new program, you get rapid results. That first month is amazing. If you start a fingerboard training program or a campus board training program, you see increases almost every week for about a month, maybe two. And then you plateau and a lot of people give up after that because they figure, well, I'm not getting much more out of this. Well, I guarantee you, elite climbers aren't giving up on it. You know, name a pro climber who is a hard trainer, and they are still eking out gains year over year. And they're not doing it by growing bigger muscles. It's what's going on in the tendons and in the nervous system and the extracellular matrix. 
is the magic that gets them gains year over year when it comes to maximum strength and power. And taking your game to the next level, all three energy systems, all begins with taking your maximum strength and power to the next level. So in any case, uh, without being long-winded, let's just uh, tick down uh, the list here of some of these adaptations, digging a little deeper uh, on the uh, neural front, that first adaptation of the nervous system. Well, there's uh, improvements in motor unit recruitment, how quick the type 1, type 2A, and type 2B motor units come into play and work together. To create maximum power output, you need to call as many fibers of all three types as possible into play. And the best way to increase motor unit recruitment is to train with heavy weights, heavy isometric training like on a fingerboard or any other type of training where you have to express high force output for a brief period of time. The second neural adaptation is increased rate coding or firing frequency. That is how fast the motor units turn off and on. If you think about a light switch on a wall, how fast can you flick that switch off and on? A slow firing frequency would be flicking the switch on and off at a very slow pace. A high firing rate, a high rate coding is flicking that switch really fast, as fast as you can go. And that is one of the adaptations that occurs. You know, muscle fibers just don't contract and hold. They are constantly contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. And so the faster you can get individual fibers and motor units to fire, the more force they can express. How do you train rate coding? A campus board. Plyometric type training, reactive training uh, is the type of training shown to at, uh, best elicit the adaptation of increased firing rate. Number three, Motor unit synchronization, just what the name says, getting more motor units to contract together. Uh, if you have a stuck car, you know, if you have five different guys each pushing the car one at a time, it's not the same result as if you have the five guys pushing the car together. And that's what motor unit synchronization is all about. How do you train it? Heavy weight, heavy isometric contractions, creating peak force output for a few seconds in a row. So again, a fingerboard or weighted pull-ups, one-arm pull-ups, those types of things are good for training motor unit synchronization. Number four, disinhibition. Okay, your brain is always trying to protect you from injury. And one of the things it does is it prevents your muscles from outputting such a high level of force that it might damage or tear a muscle or tendon. And so it acts as a governor of sorts. This protective mechanism or safeguard presents as a neuromuscular inhibition, kind of preventing you from turning everything on completely. Well, through training, you can reduce the effect of this governor. You can lower or decrease that neural inhibition. And so that's what we're after here. And the way to do it, again, heavy weight training, weighted fingerboard hangs, and also plyometric training seems to, in the long term, result in this uh, decrease in neuromuscular inhibition. Okay, the second class of adaptations that occur as a result of anaerobic alactic system training, these high force, high weight exercises are uh, architectural changes that occur. And the most commonly known and talked about one is hypertrophy, but it's not one you hear me talk much about because I don't think climbers want to grow larger muscles. Um, people talk about training blocks for hypertrophy, but that's really something out of the bodybuilding world or out of the strength athlete world. And if you're just taking those conceptual models of training for those sports and applying them to climbing, you're going kind of down the wrong path, right? Climbers have uh, unique needs, and one of them is maximum force and power output with minimal body mass, um, or in other words, a high strength or power to mass ratio. So we want to have uh, muscle cell changes, architectural changes that don't 
make for a more weighty muscle, a heavier muscle, but instead make the muscle more efficient at generating force, transmitting force, and producing force quickly. So while a beginner climber who starts training will likely have some hypertrophy, you'll notice especially your climbing muscles will get uh, a little firmer, perhaps a little larger, and hopefully your body fat will go down a little bit so you'll see your muscles a little more. And certainly an adolescent climber going through puberty will grow bigger muscles. Uh, that's fine and well. That's that's great. Uh, that person, that adolescent going through puberty is going to discover what body they have been given by their genetics. And then with training, you can remodel that body a little bit. But an adult climber, no, you should not be going to the gym seeking to put on muscle mass. I don't care if it's antagonist muscle training or training your climbing muscles or whatnot. If your body weight goes up by more than a few pounds or a kilogram or two as a result of a training for climbing program, then you're on the wrong program. Somebody is steering you down the wrong path. You know, look at the pro climbers. Look at Adam Audra. Look at Alex Magos, look at, you know, any of the female climbers who are climbing harder year over year. Are their muscles getting bigger? Are they gaining mass? Absolutely not. Most of them, their body weight hasn't changed in years. So how are they getting stronger? Well, it's not through hypertrophy. It's through these other adaptations involving changes in the nervous system and tendons that make the muscles more efficient and able to express force more quickly. And right now I'm talking about these architectural changes of the muscle and the extracellular matrix that don't involve growing bigger muscles. And really, let me just keep this short here, but muscle fibers are made up of uh, sarcomeres that are these contractile units uh, within the muscle cell. And they will multiply with training. And through typical bodybuilding training, they tend to form in parallel and grow uh, larger muscles that have a larger cross-sectional area. And that larger muscle will often generate more force, though not always. Bigger muscles don't necessarily mean stronger. Um, there's a lot of big muscled bodybuilders that aren't that strong. But in any case, with the right type of training, you can avoid developing those sarcomeres in parallel. You can avoid growing bigger muscles and instead have them line up end to end uh, in series. And sarcomeres in series, the exciting thing about that is they are more efficient muscles. Uh, they can produce force more rapidly, give you a higher rate of force development. And a more efficient muscle that can contract more quickly is a really good thing for a climber. And that's an adaptation that won't less necessarily uh, grow a much heavier muscle. In addition to that, there's the fascia, there's the extracellular matrix that surrounds each cell. And that gets remodeled as well through certain types of training to limit lateral force production um, and wasted energy and divert it into end-to-end -end force production. You know, when you're contracting your fingers or your arms, uh, the goal is to pull on the tendons that pull on the bones that flex uh, the joints. Well, when a muscle contracts, a lot of energy goes side to side, laterally. You know, your muscles kind of bulge out side to side when you contract. And initially when you contract, the majority of the force goes side to side before it begins to go end to end. And so by uh, remodeling the fascia and this extracellular matrix that lines or uh, is in between the cells, you can control and divert forces more end to end. And again, these are long-term adaptations. We're talking taking many years of training to bring about these adaptations. But these are the pathways that those elite climbers can eke out more strength and power that can generate a higher max force output, a higher maximum voluntary contraction year over year.
Okay, the third training adaptation we're after relates to tendons. And again, this is another change that takes place at an extraordinarily slow rate over the course of months and years and perhaps even decades. You know, we think of the muscles breaking down as a result of a workout and then uh, regenerating and supercompensating and muscle protein synthesis occurring uh, as part of that recovery process. But on a microscopic level, your tendons are evolving. They are breaking down and then new collagen fibrils are forming and aligning and new collagen crosslinks are being formed and tendons with training, with heavy training, high force training, tend to get stiffer with time. And stiffness is good because it allows the muscles to uh, transmit force to the bone and flex the joint more quickly and more efficiently. However, a stiffer tendon can also get injured more quickly. And so I've done quite a bit of studying and reading on this and what orthopedic researchers have discovered and they've actually, you know, of course, they take tendons, cadaver tendons, animal tendons, and they do all types of tests to them. And uh, they can do various training studies and then examine the tendons. And what they've determined is that a healthy tendon, a functional tendon, is stiffest on the bone end, but more elastic and flexible on the muscle end. And so what you end up with, with proper training, is a, a higher gradient in tendon elasticity. You make the tendon stiffer on the bone end while you maintain tendon elasticity on the muscle end. And again, certain types of training will bring about these tendon adaptations. As a rule of thumb, lifting heavy weights slowly and doing high-load eccentric or isometric exercises such as weighted fingerboard hangs, will break some collagen crosslinks near the muscle end of the tendon and hence maintain a healthy, pliable musculotendon junction. Conversely, high velocity and plyometric type training, such as campus board work, will increase tendon stiffness. Recently injured climbers and those new to advanced training should do mostly high load isometric and eccentric training whereas healthy and already really strong climbers will gain more from doing a blend of slow, high-resistance movements and high-velocity plyometric-type exercises. For example, a complex of weighted hangs and campus board work. Of course, if you do too much of this type of training, get too little rest, you can end up with a tendon injury. Or if you're a beginner or intermediate and you're not even ready for this type of training and you dabble into it, you can get a tendon injury. And the problem is, once you injure a tendon and you have scarring and uh, kind of a random collagen alignment versus proper parallel alignment of collagen fibers, you can go down a pathway of tendinosis that can plague you for months or years. Um, and so the goal should always be to uh, get stronger, to seek these adaptations with uh, proper training, but to train in a prudent manner and to never put the cart before the horse. And, you know, one of my sayings that you've heard in previous podcasts is develop stability before strength and develop strength before power. So those types of power training exercises are the last thing you progress into after several years of training that ramps you up and develops strong stabilizer muscles and uh, joints that can properly deal with high load training and high force training. Um, and so if you just kind of cut to the chase and go straight for the power training exercises, you will often end up injured. Okay, so our three-part drill down into anaerobic alactic training, the adaptations and the exercises uh, that we're after. Um, we're now moving on to part three. We've ticked off uh, first an examination of what's going on inside the muscle cell in terms of the bioenergetics. We've just finished up a quick look at the adaptations that we're seeking with uh, the training exercises that target the anaerobic alactic energy system. And now number three, we're going to actually talk in detail 
about what exercises you will want to do, uh, and then we'll wrap up this podcast. Okay, so um, what we're after here in anaerobic alactic training are exercises that target fast twitch muscle fibers, that elicit fast discharge rates and high recruitment, that uh, the exercises are going to tend to involve either high loads or high speeds, high velocity of contractions, high rates of force development. The exercises are going to be brief, lasting 10 seconds at most. Uh, And they're going to involve a small work to rest ratio. In other words, if you exercise for five seconds, you're going to be resting 10 times that long or 20 times that long. If you do an exercise that lasts 10 seconds, again, you're going to rest a minimum of 10 times that long, 100 seconds, or perhaps as long as 200 seconds, say about three minutes. And so your rest breaks between these exercises at bare minimum should be one minute and ideally as much as three minutes because this type of training is all about quality, not quantity. Okay, so what are some of the exercises you might do? Let me just go down a list here of three or four or five exercises that you could use to target the anaerobic alactic energy system and bring about some of those beneficial adaptations that we've been talking about to make you a more powerful climber and to increase your maximum voluntary contractile force. Number one, and most climbing specific would be bouldering. Now, they have to be short, difficult boulders. Uh, We're talking five moves, 10 seconds. First thing that comes to my mind is like a moon board or a a home woody where, you know, the wall is short. It's only 10 or 12 feet long. So you can't do more than three or four or five moves in a row. Um, And so that kind of forces you to be brief and powerful and maximal. So yeah, those types of hard boulder problems, moonboard problems are perfect to use in a workout that is targeting the alactic energy system. Uh, You need to rest a lot between each attempt, bare minimum one minute, ideally three minutes, so that you're fresh and can make a maximal effort. When fatigue starts to set in, well, that's really when this workout should be winding down. Another exercise, and it's a a staple exercise that I use and that I uh, program uh, and have climbers do, weighted pull-ups. You know, once you can do 10 pull-ups at body weight, doing a lot of pull-ups is a strength endurance exercise. It does not develop maximum strength. It does not target the anaerobic alactic energy system. Quite the opposite. Uh, So what you need to do is you need to add resistance. You need to add weight, whether it's a weight belt or a weight vest or weights hanging from a belay loop in your harness. And you want to add enough weight to limit your sets of pull-ups to just three to five repetitions, which again, you would do in about 10 seconds or less. And so doing several sets, perhaps up to five sets of weighted pull-ups is a great pull muscle workout that develops uh, maximum strength and again, utilizes primarily that anaerobic alactic energy system. Of course, if you're strong enough, you can do one-arm pull-ups or as a bridge between weighted pull-ups and one-arm pull-ups, you can do uneven grip pull-ups where you have one hand using a helper sling a little lower, uh, just lifting a fraction of your body weight and the other arm, the higher arm gripping the bar or the fingerboard, pulling the bulk of your weight. Again, uh, three to five repetitions and then rest for two or three minutes at least between sets. And this is a really effective exercise. Third, hangboard training. This is a big one. This is one that I think should be a staple of every serious climber's uh, training program. No, I do not recommend beginner climbers use a fingerboard. You should just climb for your initial finger training. But as you become an intermediate, you can begin to integrate some body weight training. And then as you become an advanced and an elite climber, you need to start loading on the weight and doing heavy weighted hangs or even doing one arm hangs if you're strong enough. Uh, We're talking about using enough weight to limit you to uh, brief hangs, less than 10 seconds, 
I recommend selecting a weight uh, that you could hold for 10 seconds, but then you train for only seven seconds. Uh, so you're uh, stopping each hang with a couple of seconds of hang left in the tank, you might say. Uh, my favorite protocol then is to hang for seven seconds, rest for 53 seconds, during which you're regenerating creatine phosphate. Then you do another seven second hang and 53 second rest. And then you do a third seven second hang. And after you do that group of three hangs, then you take a longer break of three to five minutes before you return to the hangboard and do another set, perhaps with another grip or perhaps with the same grip. The three finger grip positions that I recommend training on a hangboard are the half crimp grip, the open crimp grip, and the open hand pocket grip. And again, the seven second, 53 second Hurst protocol is my favorite for advanced and elite climbers. If you're new to weighted training, I would recommend the Ava Lopez protocol, where she uh, has you hang for 10 seconds, again, leaving a couple seconds in the tank, but it's a near maximal hang, and then resting for three minutes, and then repeating that hang and doing a series of those. Um, and again, you can advance uh, when you feel you're ready to using my seven second, 53 second protocol to kind of escalate things slightly. And one more exercise, obviously, is the campus board. I've mentioned it a little bit uh, in discussing the adaptations. And uh, certainly, when you get on a campus board and you do one or two powerful movements, 100%, it's the ATP, CP energy system that's at work. Now, if you're on a campus board laddering for 8 or 10 or 12 seconds, well, towards the end of that period, anaerobic glycolysis or the anaerobic lactic energy system does begin to contribute to ATP production. Not in a big way, but it does begin. And so I think most campus board training, if you limit it to just 5 or 6 hand moves or 5 or 6 seconds, you can be guaranteed you are targeting pretty much 100% that anaerobic alactic energy system. And you're going to bring about many of the adaptations that relate to the nervous system, that relate to the long-term adaptations of uh, tendon stiffness, and even some of the architectural changes of the muscle fiber and extracellular matrix itself. I'll tell you, the campus board, so many people have been injured using it that I hesitate to recommend that anybody use it, but the fact is, it is, along with a hangboard, an essential part of an advanced training program that can be utilized a couple days per week in small doses, and it produces adaptations that are not possible any other way. Uh, and so again, it gets back to just the right programming, being coached properly, on when to use the campus board, how to use the campus board, and how much to use the campus board, and then uh, resting a lot, eating and sleeping right, so that you can get all those adaptations uh, that you're after. Because, you know, the recovery is half of the workout in terms of bringing about the changes you want. And so, you know, I'm a huge advocate of hangboard training. I think that's something, it's, a, it's safer than campus board training, though you can still get injured if you do too much of it. Uh, too many days per week, I'd say you limit to just two or three days per week on a hangboard and you will hopefully be okay. If you warm up properly and uh, follow the protocols and the guidelines and don't take a, a more is better attitude, you will probably be able to hangboard train and get long-term adaptations and stronger tendons and higher finger forces and never experience injury. Campus board, it's a little more risky. You have to walk that line. Um, when in doubt, I say don't use a campus board or ease into it with feet on training where your feet are on a wooden strip or on the floor and you're campusing with just a fraction of your body weight. This type of high velocity plyometric exercises are not intended to be done with high resistance. Uh, you want to be exercising with less than 50% of your maximum voluntary contraction. Uh, and so that means you either need to be really strong compared to your body weight, or you need to use less than your body weight. 
And really the only way to do that on a campus board is to have your feet on a supporting surface of some kind. Again, quality, not quantity, is what matters. So to wrap up this section, I'm going to tell you the first rule of Eric's Train Club. Don't get injured training. You know what the second rule is? Don't get injured training. <laughs> but I'm pumped. Okay, it's uh, turning into another epic marathon podcast of Eric's. Uh, a lot of information flow here, a real high bandwidth of material. I hope you could soak it all up. I think this is one of those podcasts you could probably listen to two or three times and get more and more out of it each time. Of course, the next podcast, we're going to drill down into the other two energy systems and then try to put the whole puzzle together because these three energy systems, they do all interact with each other. You can't fall into the trap of thinking that training one of the energy systems is going to fix your climbing, is going to take your climbing to the next level. You might identify that one system is weak, but sometimes maximizing that energy system comes through the aid of the other energy systems. They are all interconnected, and I'm going to help you complete that puzzle next time around. But for now, just let me leave you with a couple closing thoughts. In terms of the anaerobic alactic energy system, we're talking about brief, high-intensity, high-power output exercises or climbing movements that last less than 10 seconds. None of them should make you get pumped. If you're getting pumped doing any of this training, then you're doing it wrong, and you're not training the anaerobic alactic energy system. These workouts are mostly about resting. So if you do a 30-minute warm-up, and then you have 60 minutes of training, out of that 60 minutes of anaerobic alactic training, probably about six of it is active time, time where your muscles are under tension, uh, where you're generating force. And then, again, this uh, work-to-rest ratio of 1 to 10 uh, needs to be uh, abided by, and if anything, err on the side of resting too much, not too little between uh, exercises and sets. When you start to notice that you're uh, exercise quality is dropping off, uh, that your fatigue uh, is uh, increasing. Uh, if you notice on the hangboard, you're starting to fail before seven seconds or before 10 seconds or whatever your, your goal duration is, that's a sign that it's time to end your workout. If you're on the campus board and you're starting to miss rungs or you're starting to lose that zip in your muscles, again, it's time to end your workout. Campusing fatigued, you will get injured sooner or later. Uh, I guess I should uh, emphasize the importance of training with good form, whether it's on a hangboard or a campus board or even on a climbing wall. If you're doing a lot of slapping around, if you're you know dry firing off of holds, if you're uh, you know doing other reckless movements. Uh, campusing with shrugged shoulders or a hollow caved in chest, you're asking for injury. It's going to happen. Trust me. Frequently remind yourself of the first rule of Eric's Train Club. Don't get injured training. Okay? So I can't emphasize that enough. And after one of these workouts, the next day you may be able to do a workout that targets one of the other energy systems. Uh, like an anaerobic lactic or aerobic energy system workout, but you don't want to do another anaerobic alactic, another one of these high power, high force workouts for at least three days. So you could do one on Monday and one on Thursday, or you could do one on you know Wednesday and Saturday, but we're talking about twice per week. And if you're climbing on the weekends, well, then you only really want to do one of these a week. I would do it on a Tuesday so that you have uh, three or four days until your weekend climbing comes around. Uh, when you're doing weighted hangs or you're doing uh, these uh, exercises that really stress the nervous system, you don't recover in one or two days. It can take three or four days to get everything back. Uh, and so if you are doing a weighted hangboard workout or an extensive campus board workout, on a Thursday, 
you're not going to be 100% on Saturday. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Uh, and so, you know, a big part of the success formula of training for climbing is the exercise programming, figuring out what to do on any given day of the week, and then adjusting things on the fly as they need adjusted. My last podcast, I talked about the value of auto-regulation and kind of testing yourself at the start of each workout during your warm-up and determining uh, how recovered you are, how much neural fatigue might be lingering, and then adjusting your workout accordingly. Those types of things are uh, extremely empowering, increase the efficacy of your uh, workouts, and you integrate that over months and years, and it's what really separates the best from the rest. That ability to get it right day in and day out in terms of what you do in the gym and then what you do to support your recovery from the workout in terms of diet and nutrition and other recovery modalities. So with that, I guess it's about time to wrap up this podcast. But before we end it, I want to let you in on a little secret. I have a new hangboard coming out. I've been working on this for the past six months. It's going to be released by Nicros sometime this summer. And it's called Eric Hurst's Ultimate Hangboard. And, uh, you know, there are several really good hangboards out there on the market. I frequently recommend uh, a few of these hangboards to, to folks who ask me. Anyway, I know a thing or two about hangboards and hangboard training. Uh, I've been using a hangboard in the gym for over 30 years, and I have actually designed two hangboards that have been in production and sales uh, in past years uh, through Nicros. Uh, and it's long overdue that I kind of come out with the next generation of hangboard. And uh, with all of my training on a variety of boards over the years, I've put together what I think are the most uh, effective holds and features for maximum strength training, for strength endurance training. And so the ultimate hangboard will be released here in the United States in just a few more weeks. Stay tuned for details. Well, that does it for this episode of the Training for Climbing podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, be safe, be strong, and climb on.